Oh, welcome everybody to the AOASG webinar number two, being presented today by Paula Callan from QUT Library and Catherine New from University Library of Curtin. I welcome you both and thank you very much for agreeing to be part of today's event. My name is Susanna Sabine, I'm the Executive Officer of the AOASG and I will pass you now over to Catherine for our Funder Open Access Policies and Requirements webinar. Catherine. Okay, great. Thanks, Susanna. Um, so as Susanna said, my name is Catherine New. I'm the Coordinator Research Services at Curtin Library. Um, in this session today, I am going to outline some of the historical and the more recent developments in open access policies and mandates from an international perspective. And then Paula will look at some of the um, we'll look at the Australian specific context and how you can apply with the mandates, um, in particular of the Australian Research Council and National Health and Medical Research Council. Um, so in the area of peer-reviewed research publications, open access simply means that a version of the full text is available online without password or payment being required for access. The term open access describes the nature of access rather than a specific business model, license or type of content. In contrast, under the traditional publishing model, journal publishers charge readers to access the content of the journal. This might either be as a pay per view, where a single article can be read, generally costing in the vicinity of $30 to $40 per article, or it may also be in the form of journal subscriptions, which can vary enormously in price had a bit of a quick search around and the most expensive journal subscription I could locate was for the Journal of Comparative Neurology, 24 issues per year at a cost of $30,000 US per annum. So open access is really great in that it helps remove costs and other barriers to scholarly material. The Budapest Open Access Initiative is a public statement of principles relating to open access to research literature. It arose from a meeting by the Open Society Foundation in December 2001. The statement includes one of the most commonly used definitions for open access, and it also nicely captures what the open access movement is seeking to achieve. Uh, you can see here an excerpt from the um, Budapest Open Access or the statement. Um, the old tradition that's being referred to here is the willingness of scientists and scholars to publish the fruits of their research in scholarly journals without payment for the sake of inquiry and knowledge. And the new technology being referred to is the internet. Um, so the public, the public good or benefit is that anyone with internet can access peer reviewed journal literature. A key driver for open access is this notion of public access to publicly funded um, research. Uh, the Budapest Statement goes on to say, removing access barriers to this literature will accelerate research, enrich education, share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, make this literature as useful as it can be and lay the foundation for uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. Uh, so momentum for open access has been increasing, you know, fairly rapidly over the last few years, with many funding agencies and governments introducing open access mandates. However, it is not just a completely recent development. Over a decade ago, in October 2003, the Max Planck Society called on their grant recipients to publish their work according to the principles of open access. They included repository delivered open access in their definition. Over the last decade, numerous funding bodies have introduced open access mandates or policies requiring that funded research be made available open access. As momentum builds, it is highly likely that more funding agencies and governments will introduce similar man mandates. Paula will discuss later the nuances between different policies and their requirements for authors. However, it is clear that these policies have impacted both on publishers and on authors' behaviour. For example, the NIH policy introduced in 2008 
required all investigators funded by the NIH to submit to PubMed Central an electronic version of their final peer-reviewed manuscript um, at the time of acceptance, and that was to be made publicly available no later than 12 months from the official date of publication. While many publishers often have embargo periods longer than 12 months, the sheer number of articles funded by the NIH meant that journal publishers cannot ignore the policy because to do so would risk losing those articles and authors would be forced to publish elsewhere. So as a result, some publishers will even send authors' final peer-reviewed manuscript to PubMed Central to enable authors to comply. Uh, this demonstrates the changes the policies can create. Uh, the HEFCE, which is the Higher Education Funding Council for England policy, uh, introduced in May 2013, is also likely to have a major impact on the behaviours of researchers in the UK. The policy states that to be eligible for submission to the post-2014 REF, the Research Excellent Framework, which is a research assessment exercise similar to Australia's ERA. Um, so in order to be accepted for submission, the author's final peer-reviewed manuscript must have been deposited in an institutional or subject repository on acceptance for publication. The policy applies to research outputs for publication after the 1st of July 2016, but they strongly urge institutions to start implementation now. This is really quite powerful because it sort of incentivizes authors to put their publications into the repository if they want, or the institution to encourage them if they want their publications to count in the exercise. Uh, other examples of national funding agencies and governments that have introduced open access policies or draft policies for consultation in the previous 12 months alone include the Indian Department of Biotechnology and the Department of Science and Technology, the Chinese Academy of Science and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada's three funding agencies. The Mexican, Argentine and Italian governments have also introduced policies and work is being undertaken by the Danish and Swedish governments, just to name a few. Most of these policies require that papers, um, that authors make papers open access, either by publishing in an open access journal or posting the final accepted manuscript to an online repository within 12 months of publication. In most instances, these policies give preference to the green or self-archiving model. The draft policy um, for the Indian Department of Biotechnology and Department of Science and Technology states clearly that they will not underwrite article processing charges lev levied by some journals. It will be interesting to see if this remains in the final version of the policy or if pressure from publishers will see this statement removed such that authors can use the funds to cover article processing charges as happens elsewhere. The European Commission's Horizons 2020 has introduced a pilot on open research data for the 2014-2015 work program. This includes the data and associated metadata needed to both validate the results presented in the scientific publications and other data as specified and within deadlines laid down in the data management plan. The language that forms part of these policies and the rationale behind open access between agencies and nations is very consistent. The two common themes are that research arises from are that research that arises from public funds should, and it's important that the information and knowledge generated be made publicly available, and that global science will be advanced more speedily through the broadest dissemination of knowledge. Uh, so this quote up on the screen now is an excerpt taken from the Chinese Academy of Sciences policy, where it suggests that open access allows all people from varying areas, often left without access under the traditional model, will benefit and be able to build upon the knowledge if it's made available open access. 
At the 2014 General Assembly of the International Council for Science, voted to endorse a statement on open access. Um, the following is an excerpt, and you can see that it is quite strongly worded, calling for immediate access and to make that available for reuse for any purpose. Uh, this is sort of the optimal, you know, extreme form of open access, uh, but Paula will go into more detail later on the various kinds of open access. Uh, from the first paragraph, they make it clear that these goals apply to both peer-reviewed research publications, the data on which the results and conclusions of the research are based, and any software or code used in the course of the research. This is part of an emerging trend to broaden the debate by extending open access expectations sort of beyond publications to data and other um, products of research. In the US and Europe, a number of funding agencies have already included data management and data sharing obligations into their funding rules. Uh, this slide provides just a few examples. Um, and to quote from the NASA data and information policy, the greater the availability of the data, the more quickly and effectively the user the user communities can utilise the information to address basic earth sciences questions and provide the basis for developing innovative practical applications to benefit the general public. Replace the term earth sciences with almost any other subject area and the same would apply. Sharing data reduces duplication. It means that people don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, so to speak, and can instead build upon the most up-to-date research to progress science more quickly. Some publishers, like PLOS, are also requiring authors to make the underlying data from the, an article be made freely available for researchers to use, unless there are legal or ethical reasons preventing this. Biomed Central has a similar policy to PLOS. Some Biomed Central journals now additionally encourage or require authors as a condition of publication to include a section that provides a permanent link to the data supporting the results reported in the article. Uh, it is also a condition and publication of both science and nature journals that authors make available to any reader materials, data, and associated protocols promptly available to others without undue qualifications. Any restrictions on the availability of materials or information must be disclosed to the editors at the time of submission. And these restrictions must also be disclosed to the submitted in the submitted manuscript, including details of how readers can obtain materials and information. While these journals may not specifically mean that it must be published in an openly accessible repository, there is certainly a movement towards this. In order to com comply with the po these policies on sharing data, one option is to deposit into a research data repository. Uh, up on the screen at the moment are just a few examples of some repositories. Data Hub is a data management hub um, used by nature. Other examples of acceptable repositories include Dryad or Figshare. Some disciplines such as geno genomics have their own data repositories and have well-developed standards and etiquette. Citation databases like Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index now provide the capability of tracking citation data sorry, tracking citations to data, which may make it more likely that authors will be more open and willing to share their data if they can see the impact that it's having. Another option available to researchers is to publish data into data journals. Data journals provide an opportunity for researchers to gain credit for publishing their research data in a more formal peer-reviewed context. Some data journals require researchers to deposit the data set in a data repository and to publish the description, location and licensing terms. Other data journals also host a copy of the actual data set. 
Scientific data is a nature publication. It primarily publishes data descriptors, a new type of scientific publication designed to promote an in-depth understanding of research data sets. Data descriptors include detailed descriptions of the methods used to collect the data and the technical analysis, analysis supporting the quality of the measurements. They generally do not include analysis of the data itself. So I would now like to hand over to Paula, who is going to go into more detail on the Australian open access policies and mandates. Okay, thank you for that, Catherine. Uh, so I'll be covering a section on fundamental mandates here in Australia. So next slide. While it's not technically a policy or a mandate, um, the Australian responsible conduct of research clearly spells out the responsibility of institutions and researchers to disseminate research findings to their colleagues and to the wider community. The code is in fact a position statement on open access, as research findings not made open access are generally not available to the wider community. The code also spells out the responsibilities of researchers and their institutions in relation to the management of research data. The two main research funding agencies in Australia are the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council, and both have implemented open access policies. The policy details are available from their websites, and importantly, they have been incorporated into the current funding rule documents, so the researchers in receipt of these grants should be well aware of the obligations. The rationale given by the ARC and the NHMRC for adopting an open access policy is as follows. To maximise the benefits from research, publications resulting from research activities must be disseminated as broadly as possible to allow access by other researchers and the wider community. Now, this aligns with the government's stated reasons for investing in research in the first place, which is to support its role in improving the well-being of society. So I'll now outline some of the key features of both of these policies. The NHMRC policy was introduced in July 2012, and it requires that any publication arising from NHMRC-supported research must be deposited into an open access institutional repository within a 12-month period from the date of publication. Now, the policy applies to journal publications accepted for publication after July 2012, regardless of the date of the grant. So if grants are a while and they're still publishing after July 2012, then they are subject to this policy. The ARC policy was introduced in 2013. Now, the wording of the policy has, is identical, but it applies to publications arising from grants awarded after the 1st of January 2013. Importantly, publication formats, so conference papers, books and book chapters, as well as journal articles. Both policies include an obligation to um, acknowledge the grant on the publications. Sorry. So the actual obligations of both policies are identical. So the grant, including the grant ID, must be acknowledged on the publication. The publication details, that is the metadata, must be submitted to an institutional repository as soon as possible after the paper. This must include the grant ID. Authors, the author's accepted manuscript version must be submitted to the repository as soon as possible after the publication date. However, it need not be openly accessible at this stage if an embargo is set by the publisher. An open access version of the paper, however, must be available within 12 months of the publication date or as soon as possible after that date. Now, this can be the author's accepted manuscript version or the published version. So they are basically allowing for both. If an open access copy will never be available, 
then this must be declared in the final report and a reason must be given. This is a question that often comes up and it is that the policies apply to publications that are partially funded by a grant as well as publications that are fully supported by the grant. So if there's one author on a paper that has an ARC grant and the other authors don't, then the, the paper still is subject to the policy. So the options are for complying with the grants, uh, with, sorry, with the mandates, um, either open green open access or gold open access. And as far as the NHMRC and the ARC are concerned, both options are equally acceptable. So it's up to the funded researchers to choose which option best suits their particular circumstances. Gold open access is where an open access copy of the published version is immediately freely available from the journal website. So gold open access is provided by the publisher. It includes fully open access journals where the entire content of the journal is freely available online immediately upon publication. Some but not all fully open access journals charge authors a fee to cover the publishing costs. For commercial publishers and scholarly societies, this fee is in lieu of the subscription revenue that they are foregoing. Whereas open access journals published at universities are sometimes free for both authors as well as the readers. Now, this is only possible because the host institution is prepared to subsidize the operating costs of the journal. Gold open access also includes hybrid journals, which are subscription journals that provide an option for the individual article to be made open access via the journal website if a fee is paid. Hybrid open access fees are generally higher than those charged by the fully open access journals. In most cases, when an article processing fee has been paid, the author can upload the published version of the article to an institutional repository or a personal web page as well. However, the terms of the publish agreement need to be read to confirm this. Uh, where it's not possible, the repository can hold the publication metadata plus a link to the open access full text, which is on the journal website. Green open access, on the other hand, is provided by authors when they deposit a copy of the accepted manuscript version in a repository. Generally, the article will have been accepted for publication in a subscription journal and copyright will have been assigned to the publisher. Many publishing agreements now specify that the author retains the right to post a copy of the accepted manuscript version on their, publish, on their personal website or their institutional repository. Now, green open access allows researchers to meet their obligation to provide an open access copy without having to divert part of their grant money um, to cover the open access fee. A more nuanced definition of open access actually distinguishes between gratis open access, which is actually free of price barriers, um, and Libra open access, which means that it's all permission barriers on reuse. Green open access is gratis OA, and for the purpose of complying with the ARC and the NHMRC policies, Gratis open access is sufficient. Now, gold open access, some, sometimes, but not always, is Libra OA. Generally, where the author has paid an open access fee, the article is published under a Creative Commons license. The most liberal Creative Commons license, uh, the CC BY license, enables articles to be reused for any lawful purpose, including commercial reuse. However, some publishers are now charging a higher fee for this license. Neither policy refers to payments for article processing charges. Both the ARC and the NHMRC, however, do allow some of their grant allocation to be directed towards publication costs. For most ARC schemes, publication and dissemination of project outputs and research activity costs are supported budget costs. 
With the NHMRC, the rules state that publication costs cannot be requested on an application, but they may be listed as a legitimate cost against the direct research costs as part of the financial acquittal process. Funded researchers, though, are often reluctant to use part of the grant to pay an article processing fee. So it's very fortunate that the ARC and the NHMRC have made it clear that green open access is sufficient. ARC grant applications also include a requirement to submit a plan for communicating the research results to other researchers and the broader community. This is researchers to think about how they're going to comply with the open access requirement long before they get to the publishing stage and hopefully certainly before they get to the stage where they've signed a publishing agreement which is non-compliant. When a researcher has a grant not all of their publications will be related to the grant and so they won't actually be subject to the, the policy. And uh, this compliance tree, which is available on the Australian Open Access Support Group website, can help researchers decide whether or not um, the, the policy applies. On the Council of Australian University Librarians website, there's actually a guide to tagging institutional repository records to ARC and NHMRC grants. This outlines the repository related requirements set down by the ARC and NHMRC in relation to publication metadata and also suggests a few strategies which may help universities with the process of collecting the metadata. Some of the large commercial publishers are keen to channel researchers, especially those with grants, towards their paid open access options. This includes their own open access journals uh, where they, the article processing fee tends to be more expensive than the article processing fees charged by non-profit publishers and even more expensive than their hybrid options. Evidence of this can be found in practices such as Elsevier's asking funders and institutions with mandates to sign a special agreement which would bind authors um, associated with grants or with the institution to longer embargo periods, sometimes as long as four years. Importantly, the ARC and the NHMRC have not signed an agreement with Elsevier at this stage. However, authors should check the terms of the publishing agreement before they sign in case an extended green open access embargo, embargo applies. Um, if it has, authors should look for another journal unless they're willing to part with up to $3,000 of their grant money. Now, Wiley, on the other hand, allows authors to comply with the ARC and NHMRC mandates by depositing the accepted manuscript version in an institutional repository and make it available um, after 12 months. This is a concession on their part, as their default policy says that only the preprint version can be used. The ARC funding rules strongly encourages the depositing of data arising from a project in an appropriate publicly accessible subject or institutional repository, but it's not actually mandated by either the ARC or the NHMRC at this stage. The Australian government has made open access the default for government information. Government publications and data are made available under a range of open content licenses, including Creative Commons licenses. The choice of license is guided by the Osgol framework. More information about the ARC and NHMRC policies plus a range of resources that can help communicate the requirements and the options available are available from the AOASG website. Great, thank you so much um, Paula.
The NMI, NHMIC says that having a paper deposited in PubMed is sufficient to have it as considered open access. However, PubMed does not give full text access, so I've never understood this part of the NHMIC policy. Can you explain this? Yep, I'm happy to take that one. Um, it's probably inferred, perhaps not spelt out, uh, open access via PubMed that would be compliant because they have said all along that while they would like to have the metadata in an institutional repository, they will accept a link to an open access copy that's on an external website. And that could be a link to PubMed, but it has to be open access at that other site. OK, so just PubMed doesn't cut it. It has to be an open access uh, on PubMed. That's right. Fantastic. Um, there was another one here yesterday that said, as an administrator, do I need to get each and every publisher contract or can I rely on the ones listed on the Sherpa Romeo Oak list unless a researcher tells me that they've negotiated something different? Um, I asked an interesting question and I think it would probably be dealt with um, by each institution in their own way. Um, we generally assume that researchers are going to tell us if they have um, signed a, if they've negotiated a different contract. Other than that, we will look towards Sherpa, um, Sherpa Romeo or the journal website to check what the publisher's policy is. Okay. Um, you say that you would rely on the researchers. How often does that actually happen that they actually tell you? To be honest, um, I think we've only ever had two researchers who have negotiated a different contract. Um, so we just assume that the the publisher's standard policy applies. It says with oh, yes. ACIDs, some publishers make special arrangements or seem to be more flexible. We are using the article information in Sherpa, but it doesn't cover theses. Anyone got any tips or information? Mm. Well, theses are um, slightly different insofar as in some cases the entire copyright is owned by the the author and so they are the people who can make who can decide to make it open access apart from when it then includes third party copyright material and then that's where we go back to the the publisher policies or negotiated agreements so this is where we would have situations of authors providing evidence that they have the, the publisher's permission to include the article in the thesis and then we can make it open access. Okay. There's another one here that says, could you please comment on open access policies on smaller grants, including curtain grants? Yes, no, um, I might have to <laughs> maybe <laughs> take that one on notice and get back, um, perhaps. Oh, we, we have an institutional policy on open access. So while we're not a research funder, in a way we are funding a lot of research that isn't related to a Cat1 grant. Um, and so we do have a policy that requires an open access copy with, within the 12 months. So our researchers have had quite a bit of practice at doing this for QUT before the ARC and the NHMRC implement it. So we, we are getting um, quite a high compliance rate with that. So we're hoping that's going to flow through to the, the um, ARC and NHMRC policies. And I think also the Office, uh, the, is it office of Teaching and Learning, um, there are some OLT grants, small teaching and learning grants that, are, um, that have an open access requirement as well. So very much a read the fine print. That's right. I think exactly. I think that when you when you're picking up a grant, there will be conditions attached, and the the grant recipients need to read those conditions. There's a comment here from someone who says, "Could we assume that ARC and NHMRC policies will drive clauses in policies from smaller funding bodies?" Yeah, I mean, I think that it's reasonable, just given the trend towards open access, that sort of more and more. Um, funding bodies, including the smaller ones, um, will be wanting to have their research made available. But, you know, that's just a gut feeling, I guess. Well, it's definitely 
the bigger funding bodies around the world are all moving to some sort of open access policy. So it, it would make sense that the smaller funding bodies would um, follow suit follow in suit. some way. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much for everyone. Okay. And thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Catherine. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>